a goddess from Babylon. What image does that conjure up for us today? Babylon was cursed in the Bible, called the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth in Revelation 17.5. This is one Western idea of what it was like. But if we go back 4,000 years to the foundation of the old Babylonian age, we see a different picture, more fascinating and much stranger to us. Probably, you did not envision a clay plaque of a nude woman, partly animal and partly human, and quite terrifying in its strangeness. It confronts us very directly. What do we feel? What does it mean? This fascinating and beautiful masterpiece of old Babylonian art from the early second millennium BC has both mystery and quite a history. It was acquired by the British Museum to celebrate its own 250th anniversary in 2003. No one was totally sure what goddess was represented. Scholars argued about it. Rumors swirled for 50 years or more. Was it authentic? Was it really almost 4,000 years old? Some experts doubted it, partly because it was so unusual, so strange, and so interesting. It was a curious mixture of the erotic and the terrifying. And it was undoubtedly mesmerizing and beautifully shaped, a testament to old Babylonian artistic skill. If we were to travel back in time to the beginning of what is called the Old Babylonian period in Mesopotamia, 1850 to 1750 BC, we would see a period of intense change and instability with shifting power between city-states in the ancient Near East and the Mediterranean world. Conquest and movement trade and war were unrelenting. Ships plied the Mediterranean, trading or bearing tribute of goods like copper and wool. City-states fought for territory and asserted their dominance, but usually not for long. The trend was toward bigger territories and more influence, and one of the biggest players became Babylon, which was not such an illustrious power before this time. The most powerful and renowned king of the new dynasty centered in Babylon was Hammurabi. He was famous for his law code and the stela which presented it in written form. You might recall that this is one of the earliest surviving written law codes, hewn in stone. It's known in the modern era mostly for its law termed an eye for an eye, which was actually an improvement on previously meted out punishments in which you could lose more than just an eye if you put out the eye of the wrong person, in other words, someone with more influence and power than you. Hammurabi wanted to be known as just and humane, and his law code was an improvement over older forms of justice. Hammurabi's law code is an iconic object. It depicts Hammurabi the king standing in adoration before a seated shamash, the Mesopotamian sun god, who holds a rod and a ring for measuring out justice. This kind of scene, which we call a presentation scene, in which a person is presented to a god shows that Hammurabi, unlike King Naram Sin earlier, is not claiming divinity, just proximity to divinity. He raises his right hand to his mouth in respect or adoration. Nevertheless, Hammurabi was a great king who conquered many, many cities across the landscape during his reign from 1792 to 1750 BC. After one conquest, he added the esteemed and very old title, King of Sumer and Akkad, to his name, and later 
took on a title that had first been used by Naram Sin, King of the Four Regions. As is often the case in kingship, with success came ever greater grandiosity, a trait which we see all around the world with rulers who proclaim themselves king of the universe. The Assyrians used this epithet, as did the Maya. You can see that this carving of Hammurabi is very rounded, a bit static, and in high relief. It was made of a very expensive stone imported from the south, diorite, which was very hard and considered a luxury. In the stela, Hammurabi wears a cap we associate with Mesopotamian kingship. He is not wearing a horned crown of divinity like Naram Sin before him. He's standing in respect before a god. We can see that Shamash is a god because he wears the multiple horned crown, which we know is characteristic of a deity. Remember, even Naram Sin did not wear this multiple horned crown, he wore the single horns of a lesser deity. This larger crown is the same kind of crown we see here in the Queen of the Night relief. And our goddess also holds the same rod and ring in her relief as Shamash. Note that Shamash also has three wavy rays emanating from each shoulder. These are rays of the sun which identify him. The Mesopotamians were very good about identifying their gods with accoutrements that reflected their function. And that made it easy for those who couldn't read or weren't sure to identify them too. But sometimes there's more than one kind of insignia or they're different from what we know. This is the case here with the Queen of the Night. Hammurabi was the king who started Babylon on the path to success and greatness. It was a backwater city and not so prominent beforehand. In the second millennium BC, Babylon became known as a center for knowledge and religious activity. We shall see in our next lecture how even more than a thousand years later, Babylon was still a great center, a stronger power, and producer of some of the greatest artworks of the time. But let's return to our goddess. Here we see a kind of object that was worshipped and regarded as sacred to Babylonians of this time. The plaque is absolutely unique. Here, in this work of art, we have one of the rarest of rare objects, an actual cult image of a goddess who was worshipped in Mesopotamia. We have nothing else quite like it. Why would a cult image be so rare? If you recall from our earlier lecture on the Royal Cemetery at Ur, we looked at the goat, a ram in a thicket. It was a sort of cult stand, we think, and was made of the most expensive and luxe materials, gold, lapis, shell, and so forth. We believe that statues of the gods which were placed in temples were usually composed of these same expensive materials like gold. Therefore, none of them made it down to our modern era intact. Most old gold and precious metals were melted down over the centuries for other uses, unfortunately. For instance, almost all the Inca artwork of gold, the riches of Peru, were seized by the conquistadors for the Spanish crown and subsequently melted down. They too mostly had gods wrought from gold. But there weren't only images in the main temples. There were images of gods in lesser places, including businesses and homes, and these could be made of humbler substances like clay. Unfortunately, not too many of these survived either, but this plaque is most likely one of them. Even with its humbler nature, it was meant to be a place where the spirit of the god could dwell. How was this made? It appears to be a terracotta mold-made plaque. First, clay was mixed with chaff, 
then pressed into a master clay mold and then fired in a kiln. The chaff burnt off, leaving the surface slightly pitted, as you see it today. But originally, it was covered with paint and very brightly colored. Enough of some tiny bits of paint survived so that the plaque could be tested and reconstructed in color. It was surmised to look something like this in antiquity. It's a little gaudy compared to the plain buff clay, but even Greek statues, which we think of as marble alone, were painted in antiquity. There would have been multiple copies of such a cult image, but only this one survives. Let's examine our queen. The plaque is 20 by 15 inches and not very deep, but it is sculpted in the high, rounded relief, which was typical of the old Babylonian period. You just saw that in Hammurabi stela of the law code. Now we're looking at a voluptuous nude woman who is represented frontally and almost completely symmetrically. She stands on two smallish lions and two largish owls are placed on either side of the lions. Usually in Mesopotamia, with this kind of cult object, the gods would be shown frontally and in a static and symmetrical position. They would be easily identified by their accompanying emblems, tools, and animals that were customarily associated with them. We immediately know that we are dealing with a major goddess when we look at the woman's head. Why? Because she wears a multiple horned crown, one that signifies a major deity. This crown is just like the one on the clay figure of a male deity of the same period, also in the British Museum. Our Lady has a plump, rounded face and her eyes, whose inlay is now lost, are emphasized by the joined eyebrows, which are so typical of Mesopotamian art. Her hairdo is rather complicated. It looks like she may have on a heavy wig or a bun and possibly some thick masses of bound hair or braided looped locks, like this goddess. Our queen has a slightly upturned mouth. She stands with both elbows out, displaying two symbols of the rod and ring in each hand. Her necklace was quite heavy. It looks like it was beaded and is now partially destroyed. She wears three bracelets on each wrist. So despite her nudity, she's very well coiffed and bejeweled. Those might be clues to her identity, since goddesses like Ishtar were known to wear lovely jewels. If you look at her body, it's very naturalistically modeled. You have the soft curves of her hips and high breasts, which do not show nipples. She has rounded but slim arms and a small waist. She has a realistic looking deep navel, but her pubic area is modeled delicately and not overly emphasized. Her hip bones are high up and her thighs swell slightly. Her legs are held stiffly together. All this makes her curvaceous and appealing, but not muscular like Naram Sin. Beneath her knee, though, our goddess ceases to be entirely human. She has what has been interpreted as a dew claw on the side of each calf. Her feet are the feet of a raptorial bird. She has talons with three toes on each foot, and the scutes, that's the scale-like skin, are indicated by parallel incised lines. This goddess seems to smile benignly in spite of these menacing attributes, but she has one more thing which we know in this context might associate her with the netherworld, downturned wings. Her wings are not outspread, but droop down from her shoulders like a cape. These wings are carefully incised with a scale-like pattern on the upper part of the wing, and the longer flight feathers have been carved in relief 
in two layers on each side, you can still see the paint colors of black and red. The goddess stands on the backs of her two adorced back-to-back -back lions, but her talons don't appear to dig into the backs of the lions themselves. The lions look rather friendly and not as menacing as usual. Their manes extend all around their shoulders and down to their bellies, and they still retain some of their black paint. Our lions look out at the observer, but their muzzles are closed. That's different from what we encounter elsewhere with Mesopotamian lion images. The whirl of hair on the shoulder of the lion is thought by the British Museum curators to represent the distinctive mane of the Asiatic or Mesopotamian lion. The Asiatic lion was smaller and blacker than his African counterpart. The artist was careful to include details like this, which might have been crucial in some religious sense. Now below the lions is a platform with an incised scale pattern. This is the Mesopotamian indication of mountains. The mountains are the dwelling places of major gods, as we've seen with the ziggurat. Two rather large and not so realistic owls stand frontally on either side of the lions. They're stiff and bear the same sort of wings and wing marks as the goddess. We have very few representations of owls from Mesopotamia, so this is a rare occurrence. The goddess and the owls have talons that are also similar, although you can see they're damaged on one. These could be barn owls, but they're not as easily identifiable. So who exactly is the goddess here? Can we solve this mystery? The black background, the nudity, the owls, and the lowered wings all give some credence to the idea that this scene takes place in the underworld. In fact, some scholars and the general public believe that this might represent the demoness, Lilith, from the Bible. But underworld goddesses or demons were not known to be worshipped. Nor would they be shown as a major horned crowned deity with the rod and ring symbol. So that identification seems unlikely, even though it has been a popular interpretation and you'll likely find it on the internet. My own professor, the late Edith Parada of Columbia University, believed that this plaque could be a very unusual representation of the underworld goddess Eresh Kigal. Eresh Kigal was the underworld goddess who was sister of Ishtar, the very important goddess of love, fertility, and war. We saw Ishtar's Sumerian forerunner, Inanna, in the Uruk vase. In one of the great surviving Mesopotamian epics, the descent of Inanna, or Ishtar, to the underworld, Ishtar is forced to go to the underworld. When Ishtar descends into the underworld, she's required to disrobe at each gate and leave behind her jewelry. At the last step, her sister Eresh Kigal takes the rod and ring symbols from her hands. So, Professor Parada believed that this was an image of Eresh Kigal holding both her own rod and ring and her sister's. Plus, the black background, the lowered wings, and the owls, a nocturnal bird, give some credence to her underworld goddess interpretation. But some still think she is the goddess Ishtar, and I tend to agree with that identification. Why? Inanna Ishtar was an immensely significant goddess. She was most likely a conflation of different forces and goddesses from different cities. Most of them were associated with fertility, love, sex, and war, a whole grab bag of significant characteristics. She was associated with lions and was often shown standing on lions, as gods of Mesopotamia characteristically stand on their animals. No other goddess was shown like that. Ishtar was even called the Lion of Heaven. In some respects, Ishtar really is a lion goddess, 
because she has the behavioral characteristics of a lion. The lion and lioness who hunt prey are perfect metaphors for portraying a bloodthirsty goddess of war. Another reason I think this is Ishtar has to do with the overt sexuality of the image here. She's sensuously modeled, regal, but full of sexual allure and fertile looking. The hip to waist ratio we see here is actually known from biological studies to correlate with fertility. Ishtar is specifically associated with lions for the metaphor of lion sexuality. She's like a lioness in that, according to myth, she copulates frequently and lustily with her many lovers. Ishtar was goddess of sex and prostitution. Lions are known to copulate 40 or 50 times a day in their courtship phase when the lioness is in estrus. The lioness acts seductively. She's a flirt and a tease, but she may decide afterwards to chase off her lion suitor with cuffing, spitting, and violent behavior. In a parallel, not all Inanna Ishtar's lovers end well or survive in her myths either. A well-known Sumerian poem in many ways foreshadows Aphrodite and Adonis and Persephone's myth of descent into the underworld. In the courtship of Inanna and Dumuzi, it recounts how 50 times Dumuzi lay with her. In fact, the king of Uruk describes the bed of Inanna as having two lions that chase each other at head and at foot as a metaphor for sexual congress. Dumuzi is a vegetation god who has to go to the underworld when Inanna or rather callously decides to substitute him for herself in the underworld so she won't have to stay there herself. This myth is a metaphor for the seasons and the dying of vegetation in the winter or dry season. It's very similar to something we'll see in Greek art and culture with Aphrodite, who in some respects is a little like the Greek version of Ishtar. But what about the unusual inclusion of owls, two lions, and claws? Why do I and others believe this is Ishtar when we have these elements that aren't usually characteristic of the goddess? While we don't have any examples of Ishtar with owls, who are predatory birds of the night, she does seem to be associated with other kinds of birds in other representations and even has these strange wrinkly bird feet in the famous Ishtar vase at the Louvre. The lion can only be associated with Ishtar. Perhaps she has two here because this is a symmetrical presentation where she's shown frontally. It would be very difficult to fashion a lion protruding so far out towards us. Perhaps the rod and ring are repeated twice in the interest of symmetry. You can see this sort of symmetry and an unusual monstrous bird in a much earlier copper relief from a Sumerian temple, about 2500 BC, here. The central and static pose of the main figure, who's connected to the two stags by his talons, is similar to the later Queen of the Night. Also, the stags turn their heads towards the viewer, just like the lions do later. This sort of centrality and symmetry is an important hallmark of Mesopotamian style. And in fact, our European tradition of heraldic devices, symmetrical animals flanking a human or other figure, probably stems from this ancient Near Eastern root. In Mesopotamia, we have a tradition of clay plaques showing Ishtar or a female frontally nude. These were thought to be related to the sex and fertility cults and were molded or made in multiples. The nude woman was always frontal. She seems to reveal her nudity without shame or modesty, unlike the later statues of Aphrodite. 
This sort of cult plaque was actually found all over the Mediterranean and was associated with local goddesses too. Another clue is this vase of Ishtar from the Louvre. This vase was excavated at Larsa in southern Mesopotamia. It dates to around the same time as our plaque from the British Museum. Here Ishtar is winged and shown with the bird feet. That makes it clear that those two attributes could be seen on images of the goddess. We also have lots of cylinder seals which depict a winged Ishtar and the nude frontality is shown on many plaques of the time. Of course, it's quite likely that we will never know definitively what this masterpiece was meant to represent. The theories that it was a plaque set into the wall and worshipped in a bordello, or that it was an entirely different goddess whom we don't know, are still possible. And we will see her again in Assyria and Babylon. An interesting aspect of this clay plaque is its very contentious history in the last century. This object was not excavated, so we can't say where exactly it comes from. It seems to have been bought and carried to England in private hands. It was brought to the British Museum in 1933 to be tested. It was even illustrated in the Illustrated London News in 1936 and called the Burney Relief after its owner. It changed hands several times after that, but some experts had doubts about it early on and thought it might be a fake. Since it was so unusual, they were a bit suspicious. The British Museum had it tested by thermoluminescence dating, which turned out to prove its antiquity. The dates they determined from the test put the object's creation at some time between 1850 and 1750 B.C. There were still doubts after that, and it was accused of being a pastiche. I have some experience with this. When I worked at a private collection, we had each pottery object tested by thermoluminescence to make sure of its authenticity. This method measures the radiation that remains in a pot since its firing. It only works on pottery. We discovered that some objects were actually pastiches of ancient pottery, like a strange duck, which fell apart into shards while it was being cleaned in water. However, the British Museum curator has shown that the Queen of the Night is definitively one piece and couldn't have been a forgery. And my professor, Edith Porada, always said to let 50 years go by to see if an artwork looks strange to the eye, because after that, it is easy to identify fakes. They look like something of their own time, not an ancient one. For instance, a fake Assyrian statue of a man created in the 1930s with an Art Deco-style mustache stands out much more after the Art Deco style is passé. The curator at the museum applied this rule to the plaque, and it seems to have held up. What we will remember, I hope, is that the powers of procreation, of sex, and of beauty were overwhelmingly important to early societies. Without sex, there would be no offspring and no survival of the family. This type of cult plaque became the object of the prayers, hopes, wishes, and dreams of the Mesopotamian worshiper.